Right, cool. So, uh, happy Sunday, bro. Yes, yes, you too. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. Yeah, but you know, money never sleeps. Work, work, work never stops. Work never stops. Yeah, um, ever, since, ever since ever since Bitcoin and, and the crypto crypto world, the market never shuts, right? So, money yeah. never sleeps. I'm just gonna. I want to introduce you, but um, I think also I'll let you introduce yourself as well. Um, so for everyone that, that that watches this back, they know um, you're the you're the big Quaku at the Bolly. Um, former trader, um, you currently in, in Ghana at the moment, yeah. yeah. I, uh, I, I live in Tema in Ghana now, yeah. So there was that the whole drama, uh, most people already know about it, some people actually don't, um, which is quite interesting. Um, I, I, I found talking to a lot of the, the people who may be starting banking now, or even one to two years, um, your name, I say your name, and it doesn't just come out. Uh, maybe because at the time the drama happened, social media actually wasn't what it is right now. Um, so it was just newspapers. And once it died down from, from our side, the new guys who are on social media just maybe didn't remember the name or maybe just didn't, maybe the story outside of finance wasn't as big as maybe we thought it was um, to, the, to the average person. Maybe just like when the headlines come out and, you know, when the trial was happening and, you know, but aside from that it was like a pump and dump in in, in, in the press you know yeah, for a lot of yeah. people which is which i didn't realize because i just assumed yeah this was this big news article going on and everyone was involved watching it tracking it but um i realized later it was actually just you know people from my generation upwards who, who followed it and really you know took opinions or whatever um so yeah how about you you introduce yourself um, however you want to um, and let's go from there um, so I mean f first thing I would say is don't be surprised that no no one really knows the name outside of finance no one knows who I am outside of finance now because most people were who you're talking to coming into finance now were maybe 11 12 years old when this yeah. happened yeah um, so it's not in their context and um yeah, the immigration drama was, you know, three years ago, uh, and that kind of continued the story and kept me in the in the in the eyes of, of, of the public. But other than that, if you're not involved in finance and if you don't really care about UK immigration policy and UK race relations, yeah. it's just not gonna it's not gonna register on your on your radar. Um, so I'm Quake Madaboli. Um, I former trader at UBS. I mean, for the context of this um, this 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 conversation, you know, I'm a former trader at UBS. Um, I, I ran um, or helped to run uh, our ETF and index book, uh, which is basically uh, the sixty billion dollar book um, that was a hedge book that we we used to to run proprietary positions for the bank. Um, the reason that people knew who I am is because um, I took responsibility for a trading loss on uh, back in 2011, um, and it blew up into um, into this huge scandal, um, resulted in, in in me being convicted um, and sentenced to seven years well seven years in prison, which I served three and a half. Um, after which the British the British never never knowing when is enough when it comes to black people decided to take another pound of flesh and then stuck me on a plane, um, transported me halfway around the world. We could talk about it in a bit more detail if you want, but yeah, yeah. I, think, I think that's, that's enough. Do you know one, one, one little question I do have? How did yeah. you find prison itself? Um, uh, I, you know, it sounds crazy um, to say this out loud, but I'm truly grateful to have been given the opportunity to see uh, the extremities of our society um and um and, and to have known to, to have learned what it means to go from the upper echelons of our society to the very very bottom um and being cast out um i learned a lot about humanity and about the, the kindness of humans um and, and about the fact that actually when when things are really tough that's when we come together and and, and human human beings are incredibly generous 
Um, I, I found that um, the institutions of state um, are violent um, and are hell bent on doing damage and causing ca causing harm to um, to various members of society or sections of society, um, and that the only protection that we have um, against that is the support that we give each other as human beings and, and the, the human relationships that um, that, um, that, that that sustain us. Because against um, the forces of, of of institutions and states. Um, if, if, if we don't come together as humans, we just will, will not survive. I mean, what the British did to me in prison, in order to be able to make a political statement um, was a really strange thing to do. Um, and whilst um, uh, in some, it may look like the British were enforcing their power and, and their right um, um, to protect their borders and you know, keep dangerous people out, um, what they actually did was show that they were willing to um, basically abuse a human body, um, and, and because I'm, I'm I'm a black body, they were willing to um, to basically treat me as if I, I I was worthless in order to make a statement about the importance of their immigration policies, which is insane <laughs> yeah. when you think about it. Um, um, so so my experience of of, of prison and and and, and um, the process I was in for so long. Um, was that human beings come to their fore um, and, and are and are incredibly um, supportive and generous of each other um, against increasingly um, uh, um, uh, inhumane um, and, and uncaring institutions and state state structures. Okay, that's great. Um, did you make did you make friends in jail? Did, did, I did make did friends. You, did you find yourself explain having to explain how you got there? in layman's terms to you know house to 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 inmates and um how did you find that was that was that a common thing did they already know who you were before you got in um yeah so i mean from the <laughs> from the moment i got on the prison bus um outside um, um london magistrates court like everyone knew who i was and all the other prisons oh i made you that banker and you know just just you know from the back of the bus No, you know it's like, and from the moment I got onto, from the moment I got onto that bus, for the rest of my time in prison, people always knew who I was, um, and but that was not a bad thing. Um, but was there respect? First, yeah. So at first, at first, I just, you know, obviously, I, you, nobody wants the attention, so I kind of, I, I cowered a little bit and kind of tried to make myself as small as possible, mm -hmm. as you would in an environment you don't know, and when. You can, your reputation leads you and, and you don't know what that means. So you kind of curl up a bit. Yeah. Um, but then I found that um, I had something to contribute to the community um, and everybody in prison also is looking for a way to contribute to the community. Um, and um, as a result, there was a lot of respect. I, 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 um, I spent a lot of time in prison advocating for my fellow offenders. I was chairman of various prison councils, um, help, helping our guys. Um, I see our guys helping the prisoners to navigate the rules and the restrictions, especially um, at, you know, um, at Maidstone, which is this foreign national jail, let's call it a foreign national concentration camp that they, they created to, to force foreign national offenders, who they were criminalizing, by the way, um, to, to choose to be deported from the UK instead of continuing to suffer in prison. Um, and, and I was helping a lot of my fellow offenders to kind of navigate the rules so that they could exercise their rights and actually protect their ability to stay within the UK. Um, and um, uh, what I found was that the other prisoners rewarded me for that by protecting me. Um, so, you know, sometimes you get the young guys coming up, you know, the guys who are start up, they call it, they call it getting start up when you go from, you know, youth, youth prison, youth jail, which is a very violent, um, a very violent place um, to, to grow up jail. Um, whenever the youth guys come up to the grown-up jail, they, when they first turn up to the grown-up jail, they feel that they need to um, prove themselves. And so they yeah. look for a target that, that you know, because I, I was high profile, I tended to be a target for these young guys coming in. And what would always happen is that I never needed to assert my, to protect myself because someone would always step between them, me, me yeah. and that person and say, look, you know, you've just got here. You don't understand. He's not one of us. And, and I, I, it was kind of weird. It was, it was a kind of an honor that they gave me, but it was also a kind of a because I was always contributing and helping everybody else. 
Yeah, you kind of got your kind of a, like an immunity. Yes, exactly. I mean, right. exactly. Right. I, I reckon the well, the closest parallel I can draw from my personal life is growing up in in Peckham. You know, mm. on in the estate. Um, two things kind of helped me get a little bit of a kind of immunity. I'd say. Um, playing football, being good at football, people always respect you. Um, and also, I used to talk to people. I used to talk to people about what they were going through, you know. So I'd really, I was almost like, I don't want to use the word counsellor, but I was always someone that, someone who was like really, really deep in crime or whatever could just, just talk to someone and just get some sort of, uh, whether it's mental health, or, you know, mm. these days, sometimes it's helped with investing for their kids or, you know, you know, this is the kind of conversations that I have. Um, so it's good. It's, it's good to hear this side of um, your story. Um, and I'm not going to talk too much about your story because I wanted you on actually to talk about your career, your path up until that point, because I feel like that's been lost. Um, mm. There's been so much focus on let's hear Kwaku's story, let's hear it from his own side and so on and so forth. But before the scandal, you're a very, very, very successful um, trader. Um, when I was starting up, you used to give talks to SEO, um, sometimes have parties, but there's still a lot of value um, there to pass on because all your experiences are still valid, especially up until that point, whether it's just navigating the career ladder, getting in the entry. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna ask you, how did you find that process? Um, I'm sure maybe when you started as a trader, you would have been you know, a bit similar to myself, even though the, the gap is probably four or five years, flying the coconut ice cream. That's, that's my analogy, right? One black guy, trading floor full of white people right how did uh, you find that how did you navigate it and how did you find your journey into that seat in the first place um so um you know my, my journey began when i was at university um i never wanted to get into finance i always wanted to go to strategy management and strategy consulting um you know, because I, 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 at university, I was involved in students' union stuff and ran Freshers' Week, um, okay. and you know, and you know, was in the International Students Bureau helping with the students kind of settle in. So I, I kind of at university spent a lot of time solving sort of bigger, big problems, um, okay. you, know, you know, stuff like that. So when I got when, when I got time to um, sort of apply for jobs, I was like, okay, I want to go into strategy consulting. But this is back in two thousand two. And it was back end of the dot com bust. Basically, all the strategy consultants, everything was shutting down. All the intern programs were, 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 were shuttering because there was just no jobs for anyone to do. And we were deep in a recession. Um, but somehow the banks were really aggressively recruiting. So I just wanted to get some experience. And I thought, you know, apply for a job in operations, get some experience for how organizations are structured, how people work. Um, and then I'll take that knowledge and I'll go and apply for, for a job um, in, 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 in strategy consulting. That, that was my plan. Okay. Um, so so I, I remember it was like um, uh, UBS was the first deadline, right? So I lined all the applications up, every single one of them. Goldman Sachs, UBS, Deutsche Bank, all of them, lined them up, all operations. And I've been to all of their milk round um, interviews and um, various activities. Um, and I basically learned as much as I could about what it meant to work in one of these organizations. I mean, there was one point where I went to a, a UBS milk round where um, one I, guy from IT, so I remember I did computer science at uh, yeah. computer science at the university. So uh, you know, I was you know, also thinking about IT. So I met this IT guy and he was explaining to me how he'd worked a 50 hour weekend and, and saying it with pride. I remember saying to AJ, that's not really something to be proud of. <coughs> Dick saying that, but you know, I would never work. You know what? I don't think I'd ever work for UBS, to be honest. If if that's the attitude, and I literally said that to AJ. But then UBS was the first one um, in, in the sequence of deadlines, so I applied for UBS. And the day I applied, I think it was the following morning, I got a call saying, you know, we'd like you to come 
for an interview. This is like on a Tuesday. He allowed to come out for an interview on Thursday, so two days later. So I got the bus back there, National Express, got the bus down from Nottingham down to London. Yeah. Did the interview. Um, and literally on the way back up on the bus, they called me back and offered me the, the, the internship in, in operations. They were really keen to offer you this job as quickly as possible. We know that obviously there's lots of other, uh, other deadlines. So, you know, we, we'd be, we'd, we want to offer it to you quickly so that you can accept it quickly. Yeah. Because um, we understand we're, we're in competition. You know, with that kind of language, you're like, whoa, okay. I'm surprised they, they you know, because you, 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 you know what? The I'm going to stop you there. I'm going to stop you there because I want listeners to, to kind of understand um, within investment banking, you've got your middle office, your back office operations. That's like not even a trading floor. That's like the support to the trading floor, right? Um, so before Kwaku finishes, I just want you to just like grasp, grasp that concept of you're being given an offer for work experience, a summer internship, but it wasn't actually in the main, on the main trading floor. Now, most traders, their route, like myself, was to actually be doing that same second year uni summer internship on a trading floor on a trading desk um so yeah you you know you're going to finish your story because you actually went from middle office back office to front office which is a very yeah. unique journey in its own right and you were able to climb all the way up to director level yeah so um so yeah um i thanks for that that clarification is important actually yeah. Because actually the context of the fact that it was operations is critical. Because what it means is that, that you know, that ultimately... You didn't go in for the money. You didn't go no. in for <laughs> the reason that I went in for the money. Let me let me be honest. I went in, I was poor guy from Peckham. I went in, I said, which job do I see dollar signs and let me suddenly <laughs> become it. interested in it. You didn't, <laughs> right? Which which is such a interesting thing because of how the story turns out. Because you're portrayed like almost the opposite persona to the person who went in. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. And what happens is that um, you know, I did this internship. To be fair, the internship was awesome. Incredible experience. Anyone who has the opportunity to, to get inside any organization, it doesn't even matter if it's finance. You can go do an internship. We have to try and do it because you learn so much about how the world yeah. is structured. And it's critical. You need to understand these things to be able to protect yourself in the future. So um, if you could get inside an internship any, of any kind, you should. And it was such an incredible experience. I met incredible, such smart people. Um, and they exposed me in such a trusting way to a lot of how the organization runs. Um, and from that, um, they offered me a job in operations. And what I didn't realize was that I think I was batting above my average. I was batting above the expected average all the time. So I was always, always helpful. For me. Um, and so, you know, I got to the end of the internship and they're like, we really want to offer you a job. And, you know, we think UBS could be a, a really great family for you. And they, you know, I remember those words specifically. I remember thinking, you know, this is a, a place I can be at where I share common values with the people who are here. You know, that's what it felt like during the internship. Then, of course, I started work in operations in settlements. So, really, really, really like. Yeah, that's not office, even. That's not even middle office where you're booking trades oh. and working on projects. This is like, yeah, the 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 back yeah, like end, catching back the end. last, catch, yeah, catching the last exceptions, right? The stuff that's falling out because you know some data's wrong or you know small mistakes, and there's no machine that can do it. So you stick a human being in there, like data entry. You know, we used to call ourselves data entry. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and and, and I literally, that's what we did. Um, but the way I approached it was, you know, this work is boring. Um, I have to find ways to automate and um, reduce the daily fails. And, you know, and, and so because I did that, um, they offered me, they, they, they said, we, as a reward, to, after the first 10 months of working in, in settlements, as a reward for, for your, work, your work over the last 10 months, um, we want to send you to Stockholm for six weeks. So they sent me to the Stockholm office. Oh, wow. Um, um, so that summer of 2004, and I spent six weeks in the Stockholm office. And what was amazing about the Stockholm office was it's a small office that had all the functions of the investment bank. So you can learn about the whole structure in one place. It was brilliant. It was a really tight family, the Stockholm guys. I got to the end of the Stockholm, and that's where I had my first experience of trading. So trading. It was one day, okay. mid, Midsummer's Day, where 
Um, it's like a bank holiday in Stockholm, but Stockholm was the center for all of our markets. And um, we were kind of, I, I was there as, as trade support. So they moved me from, 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 from settlements to middle office, but in Stockholm. Um, um, and the, the trader um, um, said to me, you know, wait, do you know how to use an Excel spreadsheet? And I was like, well, yeah, obviously. Um, he's like, okay, well, I, I needed to do something for you. I need to trade some view. I need to trade some stuff for you up for me. I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. I have never traded before. He's like, just sit down, get a spreadsheet, break this, break down this order into, you know, equal parts, spread out over time, and execute. Just go into the system and buy some every set period of time, and calc and basically calculate the average price as you're doing it. And then he and I, so I did the first one. He's like, okay, good, well done. And he gave me five more. Um, and then now, so I was managing five VWAP orders. <laughs> you know, no, I haven't passed the exam. No, I see, no, nothing. Just yeah, yeah. <laughs> breaking the law, but. <laughs> <laughs> Really fun. <laughs> it's really fun. Um, and and I and I caught the book. It was, it was this the the challenge of managing masses of information happening really fast um, and making decisions quickly and and making the right decisions under pressure um, really really gave me a thrill. And I was like, wow, this is a really fun um, and interesting part of the of, of the per of the process of the institution that I'm in. So I got to the end of that of that six weeks, and they offered me a job to 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 stay in Stockholm to transition from trade support to trading. Um, but the London guys said no. They're like, no, no, we need him back in London. He's moving to trade support in London, so they moved me to trade support. Um, so I, I basically, you know, within within a year, had moved from back office to to middle office, and I was now like basically in the same building as the traders, two floors up. Um, right. And in in middle office, the role is basically to um, to manage the traders' books, to manage their flows, to fix any problems, and basically to fix their fuck ups. I mean, it's that simple, right? Yeah. Um, and so you learn the traders' books, and you become their protection. So you, you, you know, you learn the traders' books, you learn what they're doing, you can see what they're doing based on what they're the trades they're executing. You start to learn like why they're doing certain things and when they get in trouble and how they get out of trouble. And because I mean, you got to remember when you're making that many decisions that quickly under that much pressure, you're going to make mistakes, and you're going to have to try and like. You know, it's like Lewis Hamilton trying to, you know, you know, work his way out of a uh, of a spin. Like, you know, he has to think quickly and act fast. And traders do that too. Hmm. Um, and and he, he, and as a as a middle office guy, you started to watch how they did it. And so the more you learned how they were doing what they were doing, the more you were able to come up with solutions quickly. So yeah. I became um, they became dependent on me on the trading floor in two businesses in. Hedge fund services, prime brokerage, and, yeah. and cash equities. And those two businesses are the two parts of the ETF business as they were structured in UBS. But I, I be, the, the, those two businesses became dependent on me as their trade support analyst because um, I was always getting them out of trouble. You know, some weekends, you, you, you know, there were, there were weekends where there were, I would start a project on a Thursday afternoon, some break, some long historical mistake. Um, or, for example, there was one client who's, um, cash flows were wrong because a bunch of trades had been booked wrong for about six years. And I wow. went in on a Thursday afternoon and had to unbook and rebook all those trades for, for a period of six years. And it took me from Thursday afternoon till Monday morning at 4 a.m. to get it done. Right. So that's the kind of stuff that I did that nobody else would do. Just no one else. Like a bunch of Bro. a bunch, a bunch of white guys from Essex, they're not gonna they can't be bothered to do that. They can't be bothered to put that kind of effort in. Like, forget, man. And it would always be me that would step up. And so as a result, I kept getting opportunities. So the first one that came was um, that I was asked to move to Hong Kong, but because of some internal politics, they sent someone else before me. And in that window, when that happened, they also asked me to become a trader um, in prime brokerage. Okay. And that's, so- That's literally where I started as well. And, and but that, IGS. And that's how that right. So, so I was-, I was uh, Right. So I, I wonder what role you did. I was the give up trader. Um, so um, in the middle of this, the give ups process was there's a process where um, you can buy and sell shares in the UK as a hedge fund without paying stamp fees. Yeah. And literally, I was the guy who sat in, and, and I, I think that process is morally wrong, by the way, but um, it's, 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 um, you, I was the guy who sat in the middle of that process in order to make it a lawful process, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, because if you put a machine in the middle, then it, it, it would, it would make it unlawful and the, the client would have to pay their stamp duty. So by putting me in there, um, they didn't have to pay the stamp duty. Um, and so that was my role. Um, and um, 
but it was a really dull, really stressful, um, high volume. Yeah, 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 yeah. People need. It's funny because uh, at GS they, they just have it structured a bit differently. So the give ups guys actually sit in middle office. Um, right. Right. And and my book was running the the swaps financing book, which was like right. You're market making swaps and CFD single stocks baskets or whatever to clients, and then you're funding the book via TRS. That was pretty much what I was doing. That was my that was my day job. Um, which in itself is high volume, high risk. You're trading forex. You're trading interest rates. You're you know, um, but what they did is I then had the responsibility of managing the give ups guys in Emma, maybe a team of three. Um, so it's like short selling regulations. They come in and, you know, you have to make sure, listen, new rules for give ups. Don't let any Italians or whatever come through. And yeah, yeah I mean, <laughs> I remember my first review, I got accused of being too, too soft. Right. Because like, interesting. if a short selling regulation, because I was very, you know, some people are very, you know how it is, like traders talk down to middle office and so on and so forth. Um, I was very, I was always very, very polite because some of these guys are like, <laughs> they're six boys, 40 years old, they've got kids, do you know what I mean? So it's yeah. like, there's no upside to a black guy who's 20 years old, just barking out orders or like, yeah, telling yeah. you off when you when you mess up. Um, so yeah, it's good. Um, it, it made it easier for me to understand the story um when by the way, by the way I, I kind of have to say that, that don't gloss over that point right like the amount of energy you will have spent well i know i spent making sure that because i was a black guy yeah that yeah. i approached those situations with the perfect pitch and turn and pace yeah and yeah yeah because i was a black guy because i mean we all experience racism in you know when i was when i was in trade support like there's one guy David McFarlane, I'll call him out. Racist. Yeah, C U N T. And he 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 used to make me put up, he used to make me put up my hand to ask the question. You know, if you can't figure it out yourself, just put up your hand and wait. And then when we're ready, we'll we'll we'll, we'll, we'll ask you if you're ready to ask your question. You know what so, I mean? So everyone, so the spotlight is on you to let everyone right. know that you don't know something. And right. you know, right. that happens a lot and <laughs> perception. It's crazy, and you kind of start, and so and so because because you go through that as a junior. Um, yeah. When when it comes to time to facing off to these senior guys, because because these guys are, you know, they are masters of the universe. They they can they have so much power and they have so much prestige and status that in this environment, um, you know, I, I remember walking up to Ed Keane, you know, as a super blonde senior guy, like super politically protected, and you're like, um, I would have to be really careful about how I say what I say when I. When I tell him that there's been this fuck up or that fuck up, so pardon my language, there's been this. No, 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 bro, state. no, no, hold um, on, go for it. And 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 like and like and you you, you know you had to be walking you know on eggshells all the time because you knew that there was a status difference, even though I was working harder um, and contributing way more than my colleagues. Um, I knew that like I had to still be really careful about how I presented myself because of, yeah. there's just no black people around, so bro. these guys. <laughs> there's no political correctness <laughs> so you have to be really careful how you present yourself okay so like let's talk about something that we often especially in the black community we don't talk about this enough let's talk about two things your promotion mm -hmm. your 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 you're going through the the, the the levels and then the compensation I'm going to let you lead with that because I've got some thoughts on it, but I want to hear you, you know, talk about your experience first. Yeah, so um, um, I, uh, so my, I, I didn't get, okay, we all get paid a lot in bank in finance compared to average people, but within the context of finance, I really didn't get paid a lot. You know, my first salary was £30,000. Um, you know, first few bonuses were like a thousand, two thousand, five thousand for the first few years. Um, you know, that's even you know, despite Stockholm and going to Hong Kong and you know becoming a junior trader. Um, and then um, I moved from so I became a give ups trader in like January of 2016. Okay. Um, and by and by September of 2016, um, the ETF and the index desk had 
convinced the prime brokerage guys that they had to let me move because there's a rule at UBS that said that you can't move jobs internally more frequently than once every 12 months and because I'd, I'd not been on the desk for, for 12 months and the, the, the prime brokerage guys are like nah we're not going to give him up because you know he's doing a job and we need him and the rules say we don't have to give him so so the, the ETF and index guys had to go to the, the head of, of the business to tell them to make me move. So by September of 2016, I'd now moved to the ETF and index desk. Um, and um, the thing about the role, the ETF and index role is that, I mean, really you have to be an associate director to be doing it in the first place. So within, I think a year of being on that desk, um, which, you know, when I look back now, the fact that we, 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 we uh, the fact that I was able to actually operate that desk is, 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 is a miracle in itself. Because I spent the first nine months basically just sat there looking at the book, teaching myself. You know, I, I, would, I was working 20 hour days. The, the projects that I was given when I started on that desk were basically trade support jobs, right? That they needed doing on the desk. Yeah. Um, and that's how you get in into any role. So I'm not, I'm not saying anything. All I was doing was sat there figuring out where the dividends had gone, for example. You know, on an index, so the book was an index swaps book. Yeah. So I had basically an index swap and against a bunch of individual Inventory, stocks. Inventory, yeah. Had your stocks paid a dividend it had to be reflected in the in the index swap and the system that they built to do this didn't work very well so that all these dividends had gone gone awry and the dividend reconciliation for that whole year was wrong and i, I started in september of 2016 and spent those first three months literally unpicking the dividend book and then writing a report as to why there was a four million dollar slippage in the dividends that year um, um, and like, and I was like, I thought I was going to be a trader, <laughs> but this yeah. is what I do is that, um, along with basically executing client orders, basically, basically all you're doing is pressing buttons, right? Client sends you an order, you click accept, you send it to the market, you, you know, run it through some Excel spreadsheets, calculate the average prices and, and, and put them out. So that was the client stuff. And then I was doing some, um, um, sort of risk, sort of book risk management. So obviously it's an index book. So you have to manage the index port, the index composition files to ensure that the book is properly hedged on the automated hedging systems yeah. on a daily. Um, so, you know, so, the, so my mornings used to start at 6 a.m. Um, and, um, you know, I would do all that risk management stuff. Then the other guys would get to the desk around seven. And we'd trade all day and get to the end of the day. I'd do the book cleanup stuff. Um, and then in the morning, I'd get back in and I'd do the p and and do the risk, risk management stuff. Um, and I literally, um, what, what happened is that because um, I was doing all that technical stuff, but I was also, I'm also naturally a very client-facing person. Um, you know, my, my nickname on the trading floor was Care Bear. Um, <laughs> um, because I, I had time for everyone and my colleagues had time for no one. So you do it often, there'd often, often be times where John Hughes would be sat on the end of the desk. Yeah. Like sat there, like on, 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 on BBC Premier League website, kind of, you know, checking, checking how Middlesbrough were doing. Um, and, and, and there'd be three people stood next to me, um, like waiting for me to finish with the person so that they could ask me to fix something for them or ask me to execute something. And I'd, and I'd always be like, wait, just go talk to John. Like, oh, shit, go talk to John. Um, um, uh, you know, or you'd be on the phone because there'd be three people still there, be like, just go talk to John. Um, but that, I mean, and so because that was my work environment and, you know, just do your best to, 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 to advance yourself and learn and execute well in that environment. Um, and I did. Um, so, they, so, they, so they promoted me um, 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 quickly. And then... Um, I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of one of those things in banking where if the things that lead to your promotion are, if the average salary of, of the role you're in is really high, um, and then, then they have to promote you in order to justify get that salary. You, get you in line with pay, at least right. the, the then, lower end of pay, total comp. Correct, 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 correct. And then the second thing is that um, if you're facing off to a lot of clients, your seniority is really important. And obviously, we were an ETF desk. Um, you got to remember this is an ETF desk, which in two, 2005 had about $250 million of assets under management. And by 2006, 2007, had $60 billion worth of assets under management. Wow, crazy. And it is mind-boggling numbers in terms, of, in terms of growth, of risk, and portfolio, and size, and responsibility. 
and importance and influence, etc. And so when Mike Foster, so what happens is that my boss leaves, Mike Foster, my boss, who pulled me onto the desk in 2006, he leaves in 2007. Um, literally nine months into my time on the desk. So now there's no one, literally no one understands the book apart from me and John Hughes. Um, so the little I'd learned in, in the nine, 10 months before John had, uh, before Mike left and the bit that John had left in the 20 months that he'd been on the desk was all the knowledge we had. No one else had in the bank had any knowledge. Well, they had bits of knowledge, but no one understood how to run a book like this. Yeah. Um, and so obviously the responsibility on our shoulders were huge and, and we were meeting it, you know, um, we weren't losing money. We were, you know, there was one bit where the clients uh, thought we were you know, the worst thing in the world um, after Mike left during the financial crisis. They didn't realize that the reason it was tough for us was because the bank itself was putting restrictions on us. Yeah. Um, that was making us making it difficult for us to make really good prices. But prices. we figured out a way to make really good prices for them. And of course, so our clients really trusted us and, and you know, we continued to grow the book through the crisis. And so as a result, they rewarded us with, I got a director in, Oh, 2009, I think, I, I, I got made director. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, it, it basically sometimes what happens in banking is that you just end up getting lumped with so much responsibility. Um, and in our case, it's because our book was a bunch of black holes. You know, when they tried to replace Mike Foster after we left, they'd been paying Mike Foster about 300, 350,000 pounds a year, all in. Um, and uh, I think... Apparently, Mike left to go to Morgan Stanley for three times that. Uh, but when UBS tried to replace Mike, they realized it was going to cost 10x what they were paying Mike. So three, three and a half million. And they just weren't willing to pay it. So they gave the job to me and John, right? Uh, at the oh, it's, good. Was only it's good to know the there. numbers because it's another thing, right? Um, this industry is very, very quiet. People don't yeah. know. Especially in our community, people don't know the numbers, right? You get offered 200k, 300k, not knowing that really the cost of stealing you, poaching you, you could be three mil, two mil, one mil, you know? Um, yeah. And, you know, it's one of the reasons I wanted to have these kind of discussions is so people can hear it, so people can mm. know that, look, times have changed, let's face it. You know, these numbers are probably not going out anymore, but there mm. are some people still chopping these numbers. There's some mm -hmm. people who know what the market is and when they're moving they come out with a number that to us might just sound so crazy mm. and unjustifiable that we're still thinking what's the base salary of uh <laughs> you know what what there's they're, they're the numbers that everyone gets to see and you know what mm. your industry average is and there's the numbers that no one gets to see unless you are in specific circles yeah. And even then, you may not see those numbers, or even know they, they, you know, people are getting this kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted to have these kind of discussions, so people actually know the kind of money some senior people were getting um, back then um, in, in, in the same industry. Um, and then you then compare that to, you know, at some point you would, have, you know, by director level, you then know what you should, have, you know, you know what you should have been getting seven figures and so on and so forth um versus what you're actually getting um and it just highlights the whole i kind of feel like by the time we get around to properly doing um gender pay gaps and ethnicity pay gaps a lot of people who were on those enormous salaries right um they, they would have left the system so yeah. it's almost like your starting point is five five years too late to really know the extent of what the gap really was like. So it gives yeah. a lot of banks time to package and get their house in order so things don't look as bad as they seem. And those on the higher pay bracket, they can find a way to justify it and prepare. So by the time the reports do start coming through, they'll still be outrageous. People will still be like, wow, but they, they, if if only they knew how much, how bigger that wow could have been yeah. if they had that yeah, yeah. same data three, four, five years earlier. But look, exactly. got to start somewhere. Exactly. Um, and I, you know, I think I think if, uh, you're right. It's it's really important to to just 
to remember that. I mean, I think at UBS there was there was it was actually one of the employment rules that if you just it was a it was a sackable offense to discuss your salary. Mm. And um and, and we actually honored that when we first started, you know, this kind of thing we're like you you follow these rules. Um and it's only in hindsight that you realize, nah, don't no one was sacking you. No, yeah, because <laughs> you move my 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 eyes opened like when when you move around and you realize, wow, so people are really talking about this stuff that I used to like, mm, mm, you get your bonus. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. No, you're going to talk about it. Otherwise, you don't know. And if but you don't, you don't know, know that three out of the 10 traders are discussing this stuff and they know. Yeah. So management then has a bit of a problem, but they, they resolve it. And then everyone else still in the dark. Everyone else is in the dark. And it's, they don't and, have to be, they it's don't a game, rewarding. basically. Yeah, it's fair. There's a lot of fair. It used to be, you know, uh, our guys, you know, you know, I, some, you know, so the guys used to quip that in banking you always got paid enough to keep you there, yes. hungry for more, but never enough that you were happy enough to leave. So you you always keep you on the on the hamster hamster wheel, just off you a little bit more. And and so having a conversation about you know the true numbers um, breaks the system because everyone actually knows. Oh my God, he's earning like a hundred k more than me. Why? Like. I do way more work than him. Oh, it's just because he managed to figure it out before everyone else and put in an ultimatum quietly and said, pay me more or um, I'll yeah. leave. Which is um, something that the black guy doesn't do in the city. You don't do. We Especially don't when do. you come from a certain type of place. But even then, <laughs> there's this... The first time I resigned from a role, I got headhunted, go to a hedge fund. It was one of the most liberating things ever. Because they start offering you things you didn't even think were possible. <laughs> and you learn. And I, and, and I remember I said to my boss at the time, he asked me, what do you want, Debs? He said, this is what we can do. My, my eyes lit, but they didn't light in his face. They, they lit inside. <laughs> like, I couldn't believe it. I said, you know what? I just want your blessing. Uh, the opportunity I found is, you know, too good to be true. Um, happy with the conversation, blah, blah, blah. But honestly, I just want your blessing. And the reason I said that was like, it was an anger. Mm-hmm. So you lot could mm-hmm. have been paying me this. You could have been doing this, but yeah. I, and it's yeah. only because now, now you want to show me. That's even more of a reason to leave. But at the same time, you don't want to, say that out loud which is another thing like we there's this thing about burning bridges don't want to burn bridges um so you yeah but that's you you leave on good terms yeah because you know how hard it was to even eke out that opportunity as as a black person you like you're okay even though this person has disrespected me and actually hasn't treated me equally you know i'll just i'll just still be nice people talk people talk yeah you don't want to burn bridges. But at the end of the day, um, the way I now see it, which is, you know, different to how I used to see things is, they're the ones actually burning bridges with me. And once you start seeing things that way, the fair goes. And you and, become and you more know, no, hold, of, no holds barred. That is true. Especially when you realize what your true, what your true value is, right? Like... You know, it took me, it's taken me a long time to realize what my true value was at UBS. And what you don't realize is that your value is literally the amount of effort you're putting in and showing that effort you're putting in. Everyone else can see how hard you're working. And it drags everyone. You know, black people don't realize. You think that, you know, our parents told us you have to work two times, three times as hard as everyone else mm. um, to just, just to keep on a level pace. What we didn't realize, because we've been told that since we were kids, we didn't realize is actually you're outperforming. And your outperformance and your effort level is dragging everyone else. It's actually influencing everyone. I mean, this is an age-old story. It's been happening for 400 years. I mean, how did how did Edinburgh get built the way it is? You know, it's um, driving everyone forward in terms of in terms of achievement because we work so hard. Um, and I think I'm sorry. I'm going to have to try and fix this phone situation. Um, 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 but I think that like um, it's important to remember that. When you go into work and you're like giving it everything, sacrificing everything because you know how hard it is to get there and get the opportunity, what you're doing is actually driving everyone else in your organization forward. And when you realize that's your value and how important that is, 
and you can articulate that to your colleagues and your employee and your employers, that gives you the, 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 the bargaining chip, the leverage that you need to be able to go into these conversations and say, you know what, my true value is this. You know, one of the best things someone said to me is go see a headhunter. And I thought it was like a show of disloyalty to UBS. We couldn't use LinkedIn is in is amazing because all my time in Goldman, no one had LinkedIn. It was almost seen like you're looking for a job. It was almost seen mm. like now everyone, everyone's on LinkedIn. You get the grads come out, say, oh, everyone's on LinkedIn. But back then it was almost a taboo to be on LinkedIn whilst yeah, being was, in a job. It was almost like you're publicly you're connected with, head, with headhunters. That's you know? true. LinkedIn was brand new back then. Yeah. 2010, 2011. Yeah, you're well, right. It's, and it's, like, it's, it's, it's changed the game now because now people are a bit more aware of what other roles are out there. How would you have known when other guys were hiring? It's a phone call. Yeah. Yep. Like, it, it was a phone call from friend to friend back then, right? Yeah. It wasn't publicly available like it is on LinkedIn where you get all the firms literally just listing all their positions. So that in itself was already networking that we didn't have. And what I found is with technology in general, not just in finance and not just recruiting, even you see it in the press, right? Twitter. Yeah people become more liberated to get access to information they otherwise wouldn't have. It's still not the inf- you know, complete in the, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a manner of information that they're getting, but it's like massive. It's still really big to know that whatever job you're in, you can go on LinkedIn and see who, which other firms are hiring, at what level, roughly what their compensation is. Mm. Um, and yeah, if you're not happy with your role, you can start doing that um pursuing trying to, to to find a new home um mm. some advice because at the moment i you know i try and help Deb, 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 yeah. hold, before you ask the question hold this question for a second yeah they're trying there's a phone somewhere making noise i'm going to try and stop it okay and i'll be right back I'll all right two seconds There we go. Yeah, bro. All right. Life. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, basically, the question I wanted to ask you, right, is I'm trying to help people who are already started in banking. They're three years in, four years in, five years in, six years in. They're pushing for a director. They're pushing for managing director, you know, and the lateral hiring, the experience hiring side of um, diversity recruitment. Because I feel like a lot of good work has gone into entry level. Right. Yes. I am seeing representation now in an amazing way all, on entry. All that, all that SEO stuff. Back yeah, there. yeah. Rare recruitment, SEO. And now it's about retention. Retention, promotion, pay. This is like these are like the next levels that will help us really see the big difference. But it is a volumes game. And at least at entry level, we're seeing the volumes. Right. So on an advice level what would you say is one of the most important things that someone who is maybe a couple of years into their career um should care about Uh, i think the most important thing is your network and i mean it's it's not really rocket science genuinely um you have to build alliances and find mentors and and mentor people. So you have to create effectively an ecosystem of hierarchy around you. So find someone that you aspire to, find someone that you wanna learn from, find someone that you wanna replace, and then go and sit with that person, tell them that you'd love to learn from them because they're an inspiration to you. Um, And it doesn't have to be someone in your organization. It can be someone in another organization. By the time we're talking about becoming managing director, pick up the phone and call the CFO of, which other, uh, which other, whichever other company you, 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 you know, that you see someone in that you aspire to. It doesn't matter where they are. I saw an awesome application letter um, that um, uh, a lady wrote. Um, she was working at, um, it, she was working at AIG at the time um, and um, uh, wanted to go work at Coinbase and wrote an incredible application letter. And she basically just figured out, um, you know, what her skills were. Um, and what Coinbase needed, and wrote a basic, uh, wrote a letter, 
a one page of basically saying, you know, these are my skills and these are your needs. And I think I can provide for them and have the courage to do that, whether you're applying for a job out of, out of the, you know, out of the, out of, you know, just out of thin air, or whether you're approaching someone and asking them to be your mentor, learn about the person, get in touch with them and say, you know, I would love for you to be my mentor, or at least to have a conversation, right? Yeah. Then you start to learn, you start to meet individuals in various positions, in various roles, and you start to learn how different organizations interact yeah. with each other. Right. And how they work internally, of course, but also how they how they interact with each other. And so you, you learn the structures of how the organizational networks across industries are set up. And so when you're starting to think about getting promoted to MD or, um, you know, going into a C-suite type role, um, you need to learn organizationally how your organization works, but also how it interacts with other organizations um, in order to basically add value at a systems level. Um, because that's what your real role is when you're going to these senior roles. You're not really executing anymore. You're, you're making sure you're, you're meeting policy. You're making sure you're recruiting people um, that will execute on a plan. And you're, you're making sure you know what the plan are, what the risks embedded in it are. And those are the real, the, the, that's the real nature of, of, of senior level roles. Um, you know, you're not doing the execution anymore. So, I, you know, you, your, your skill set is important because it, it tells me about your history. But I think, you know, it's more about your ability to manage people and to manage processes um, and to understand policy. Um, and so your network of people that you meet and spend time with should be helping you to understand those aspects of the organization's hierarchies and structures around yeah. the world. Um, and, and that's, I think that's, you know, that's where you need to put your, your efforts um, to, 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 to grow it and to move into new roles. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, I agree with that. You know, my, my answer would have been network. Um, Yep. networking up networking down because people get promoted and people get promoted at different rates um mm. what i've mm. seen over the past 10 years is some people reach uh, vp in seven years and some people reach vp in 12 years you know mm -hmm. um and you never know where someone and, and networking down is i don't even like the word down having mentees um is quite important especially early on yep. in your career because mm those mentees can actually be people who know which jobs are going in their firm and yes. can make referrals, right? And can give you insight into also how firms work. It's not always, um, and they could have connections as well that they've built. Imagine someone you mentor suddenly goes to another American bank, networks internally there. That's two of you have got powerful networks. And then imagine that on a scale of just 10. Like, yeah. and then you add that to networks you've made of you know people who've already been in in a system for a while you realize very quickly um that you you're in a place where you suddenly become more connected um very quickly it's like yes. a pyramid um and, and uh, gone and um and and um it's interesting listening to you talk because I realize that now where I am today in, in Africa, where the majority of the world's opportunities actually, actually let's get on to that. The hair and now network, really. the hair and now what's what's Quaku doing? What you up to? Um so um I'm doing a whole bunch of stuff. Um um Deb, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry to pause this again, right? No, One second. I just gotta make sure the power's working right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, now we have power again. No, um, okay, so what am I doing now? Well, I'm, I'm in Ghana. I've been here almost three years. It'll be, it'll be three years in about a month's, in about a month's time. And um, I have spent the three years, first, the first year was kind of recovery year. So I literally sat in my bedroom at my dad's house for nine months. I had no shame. I sat in a room for nine months and I was broken. I, Okay, like everyone kept calling me to meetings and various people in Ghana wanted to learn and um, sort of learn about my story and see if there was any lessons they could take away for themselves um, to see if there was anything I could contribute. So there were meetings I would take in the first year where I would just go and meet someone and just ask them questions about the organization. And then the second year, um, I started to try and get involved in a few things. So um, one of them was um, started working on a project to build a mortgage-backed bond marketplace um, because 
the mortgage system in Ghana doesn't work. And we figured out that basically um, there's a, uh, a duration mismatch, let's call it, between the pension funds and the banks in Ghana where there's no, there's no mechanism for refinancing for the bank. So the pension funds, and there's no mechanism by which you can use pension capital to refinance the bank. And there's no other way to refinance the banks other than foreign direct investment from outside institutions, right? Okay. So, um, and we, we realized that in order to be able to provide CD-based mortgages in Ghana, um, that would remove the need for foreign direct refinancing of the mortgage market. Uh, we needed to bring the pension funds and insurance companies and get their capital to refinance the mortgages sitting on the bank's balance sheets. So I started working on a project to do that, and that's that's ongoing. Okay. Um, you know, we're at the, we're at the time we're, we're trying to um, let, um, lobby the various institutions to, to get behind us and give us the license. Um, so that's great. Um, and but then the problem and, and, and then some other consulting staff, um, you know, got pulled into um, um, uh, a few kind of fintech projects um, to, as an advisor um, to kind of, you know, basically as, as an advisor to the leadership or the CEOs of um, um, Blue Space, for example, um, where I you know, become a sounding board for these senior guys who literally just talk at me. <laughs> it's actually kind of, it's really interesting. So they just kind of talk at me. Um, and express you know, their ideas or, 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 or ask questions about um, what it is they're working on and then just get my feedback as to what I think. Um, and um, it's sort of like counseling for senior leaders. It's yeah, yeah, really yeah. interesting. They, they, um, they load you with the data, their worries, everything, and then you kind of filter through that and then yeah. come back with, you know, not, not always solutions, but um, counsel, you know, what you feel yes. could be interesting. Yeah maybe sometimes some new ideas of, of your own that you think they could implement and, you know, sometimes, you know, problem solving, direct, direct problem solving. Exactly. All right, that's good. That's um, interesting. It's, it's, uh, it's good you, you were able to, you know, be, be pretty honest about the fact that you, you know, you, you were broken. You, you felt broken when you, when you landed back. Um, and I like a bounce back. I always, the, the ability yeah. to, it's, it's trading, right? But it's your life. Yeah. The, the ability to come back from setbacks, the ability to be in a place, in a dark hole, kind of don't know what's going to happen next. And, you know, battle through and come back. You know, I know from a mental health perspective, like this stuff isn't easy, right? You, mm. you know, went to school, you followed all the rules, you, you know, did your route one, you ended up, you know, going from middle, you know, back office, middle office, front office, becoming a director at UBS um, on the trading book. Something that you become a you become a role model to other young aspiring black traders, and then the scandal happens, and it's a bit like um, I, I'll tell you this story. So at the time, I was working at a prop house, right, Jewish family mm. office. And, you know, it was, I was, I was market making your eyeball um, and trading stirs. And the way it was, was if you had a good month, your limits went up. Mm -hmm. And your limits were meant to go up to a point where you're making 5K a month, 10K a month, 30K, 40K kind of stabilized there. That was the path everyone around me had. And, when your story came out, I just finished a month, great month. <sighs> Cleaned up, did a lot of round trips so you get rebates as well from the exchange. Had a very strong PL month. My lyrics were supposed to double. Guy calls me in the room, he says, just, you know, when someone's just giving an excuse. You know, you know the, the risk management of the firm right now, you know, everyone's in similar positions, blah, blah, blah. But what he didn't know, again, network, this is where network is important. A lot of guys used to come to me to get plays for your eyeball. Like they wanted to know what devs were trading. Everyone, even my boss wanted to know what, what devs got on the book, right? Because I, I was getting numbers that they didn't get when they had my limits. And I'm talking about four or five times their numbers, right? So they always wanted to know what I had. And because of that, I was able to build networks. 
to a point where I knew when when they had bad days, when they had good days, um, when their limits were getting increased. So I already knew that some of the new guys, some of the more experienced guys were getting limit increases before I had that conversation. So that conversation for me is like, okay, I know what these guys are. Let's see what they're going to offer me. But I didn't tell them that I knew. And I knew it was 100% linked to what happened. Because there was almost, there was a sudden like trusting, right? And I, and I do feel that there's a lot of pressure when you are breaking ceilings, when you are um, a black guy flying a coconut ice cream. Um, there's, a, there's a pressure to, to, men, to, to mentor. There's a pressure to mentor to try and make sure that the door's open for the next people coming. Again, and something that I don't think black people did enough. But I saw you doing it. I did it. There are others who did it, and there are others who didn't. But everyone's got their reasons. But when you do feel like a role model and things don't go to plan, do you feel a certain way? Do you feel like you've let all black people in the country down? <laughs> uh, let's, let's call it spade so a spade, you know? Let, 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 let us be honest. It really did feel like that. And, and a, lot of, a lot of people said directly to my face, I can't believe you had this opportunity and you scored it this way. I can't believe you had an opportunity to set an example for other black, young black people and you squandered it this way. Mm. Um, you know, and it hurt. <laughs> it, it because hurt they don't, you know. no one's ever going to know the full story, right? And, 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 you know, that's why, you know, conversations like this are important because from my perspective, I didn't see it that way. But I'm, I'm emotionally mature. A lot of guys aren't. And for me, I could see, I didn't even know the extent of, no one really knows, right? They limit stuff in the press. They, but the edge I had is I've worked on that desk. I've worked in that specific business and I understand yeah. risk. And I know that that loss is not one person prop trading on one thing. And it's just like, I, I know that, but most people wouldn't. Even traders within FX Trader wouldn't, wouldn't have a clue of what your product is. Like you said, only you and someone else really in the even in the equities the stocks division no, you know would have been able to understand you know what was going on there so for me it was these people are being racist they've taken that thing and suddenly it's me more than it was quaker look what you've done now everyone thinks all black people are lying stealing uh flight risks or what you know, all the, all the yeah, stereotypes. Yeah, yeah. All um, of the, yeah. yeah so I, I want you to know that um, there were quite a lot of people who, you know, who shared my view. A lot of people did know without knowing what, what was going on, right? There was scapegoating. There was, you know what, make a deal. Right? You can't really trust people, you know, in this industry. And sometimes you learn the hard way. Um, but more importantly, I'll say this, right? Everything happens for a reason, right? Like, yes. right now, everyone knows who you are. That's a commodity, yeah. right? It will be a commodity. Everyone knows who you are. Everyone knows, um, you know, a little bit about what happened. And that's, that's kind of made you... A, a celebrity, you know. Right reasons, wrong reasons. Your name is out there now, right? History will remember you. Some parts of history might think, oh yeah. But you have to remember, you still got your whole life ahead. You still got whatever you're going to do now. And you're still going to have multiple opportunities for people to actually maybe understand a bit more, right? Nick Leeson is living his best life right now, yeah, right? He and he was a bad guy. <laughs> well, maybe we don't even know, right? Maybe we don't even know. But the bottom line is like, in life, sometimes things happen that just, 
just just catapult us into a place we, we weren't expecting, right? But 10, 20, 30 years from now, you would have made an impact at the end of the day, right? Because um, I was reading this book called Black and White on Wall Street. Have you read it? No, I haven't. It's a very similar thing. Very similar thing, but in America, love a guy scapegoated. And yeah, like I'm sure a lot of people don't know this guy's story, but yeah, I stumbled across the book. You should give it a read. It's, it's very, it does get a bit technical at times, like into the detailed manner of, you know, what it was trading, um, mortgage stuff again. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately it's like, I read that book and it's inspiring. Likewise, there's going to be a time, we, I think we're probably there, where people actually, and, and this is why I wanted to, to highlight the other side of your story. I think not enough attention has gone on to the fact that as a black guy, you went from middle office to, you went from back office to front office. That in itself, and I don't, for everyone who, who's listening, it's a miracle. <laughs> Call us where the spade. Because I know a lot of white people that couldn't do that. I know a lot of white people who struggled and tried to do that and didn't, right? Becoming a black trader already is, is you know what the numbers are like from internship, it's crazy, right? Doing it from back office and the route you did from Nottingham, it's not like you're a black kid who went to Cambridge and then, you know, the PR was, it was Nottingham, back office, front office in a short space of time, right? That in itself, you need to shine the spot. You know, I'm shining the spotlight on it, but it tells the, the, the story very differently, right? So, so here, so here's 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 um I'm gonna put a mirror up to that, and it's really interesting um, because that very same context that you've just created um, was used to say that my moral failing. Right, in all of this, right? they, they, they scrambled around really hard to find the moral failing. They couldn't even find that I was greedy and I was doing it for some financial gain. They, like I was literally found not guilty of four of the charges because they couldn't, like they were, the jury was sure that I was not driven by financial gain. Um, so they couldn't find the moral failing. So what they found was that I was too ambitious and the excess ambition, it's always, it's only ever black people who are too ambitious. Um, yeah. Um, um, but, but, but that was, that, that was because I'd gone, you know, he was so ambitious and he was so desperate to go from back office to the glittering status of being a trader. And that was my moral feeling. And, and in hindsight, it's really interesting to hear you say that exact same context, but say that actually it's a, it's, it's, it's a mark of, um, for of, many of us getting there was it. Yeah. And, um, and the other big thing that that often goes unsaid is there are a lot of traders like myself. Um, you make you make you have very good years in the bank, mm -hmm. but that doesn't actually translate to your pay. Yeah, that doesn't actually translate <laughs> to your compensation, and because we know that, or we believe that, and we've seen it. Even that goes out the window of ambition. Your ambition just becomes title. Because you know, yeah. if you're, I mean, I had a year where my budget, right, was to a mill. Mm -hmm. A mill to, to just keep our, our, our funding cheap. Yeah. A very bare minimum. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I must have, yeah, tripled or quadrupled that. Um, and over like a two to three year period, the numbers on the financing book was positive. Mm -hmm. And funding, you're paying funding. It turned into financing arbitrage where I was okay. actually, take, I turned a loss making business into a profit generating engine. But was I remunerated what I should have been if I was like white? 
Absolutely not. Isn't, isn't this isn't this what we we're talking about earlier? <laughs> right. You've got the ambition, but even if you fulfill the ambition, it doesn't translate into pay. But yeah, it's been it's been a good conversation, bro. I mean, we can always have like more. Um, but yeah, yeah I just wanted to. I felt it's important because I do a lot of you know careers, mock interviews, all this kind of stuff um, with rare. I don't know if you remember rare recruitment. I do, I do remember. Yeah, yeah, that. so, you know, I, I do a lot of stuff with them and I just kind of feel like people need to hear stories because I feel like sometimes you get candidates who don't appreciate the opportunity they have in front of them. Um, and, yeah, it's just good to hear two people talk about this stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I am, so two, so two things I want to say, um, or three things I want to say. First of all, this is, it's really great that you're doing this and it's important to, that these conversations continue. Um, if you want me, I'd love to come back, just come and have a chat. It's, really, it's just fun to just chat. Yeah, bro. Um, so, you feel um, liberated, bro. And like, yeah. you haven't even told me that. Being in Ghana it's for just, three years, you've now, re the shackles are off. And we have to, you know, let me, let, please, let me come back. Let's talk about what, 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 that, what, what that actually means. Let's talk about what's actually happening in Ghana and what it means for like, you know, you know, the, the, the London Lagos kids and the London, London Accra kids, um, all of you diaspora kids out there, you know, let's have a conversation about, about what that really means. Um, and I'd love to come back and, and talk about that. Okay, um, we'll do that. But, but the second thing I want to say is like, you know, when I got to Ghana, um, I realized that um, I had been, you know, like put on a pedestal for getting to, into, into, into onto a trading desk and running the biggest book in, helping to run the biggest book in the bank. Um, well, running the biggest book in the bank, for fuck's sake, John Hughes wouldn't be doing it. Um, when I got to Ghana, I realized that it would have been much more useful if I had spent my career in operations. Because what we're doing here is we're building systems and the operational knowledge and the technical knowledge is way more valuable than the trading and execution knowledge. And I, you know, I was like, damn, I actually wish I'd stayed in operations um, because the value on the ground here is, um, is, is, is there um, in terms of building. And the last thing I would say is, um, you know, to wrap all that around, you know, earlier you asked me, what am I doing today? And um, there's one thing I didn't tell you, which is that I've been kind of working on helping my dad to increase the yields from his mango farm. He's got a small hundred acre mango farm in Aveima near the Volta River. And, okay. you know, we've done everything this year. We've tried selling mangoes out of pickup trucks. Uh, I mean, this year would have been rough because of um, lockdown and the pandemic, bro. Like, so, especially so, if you're exporting. Yeah, so, so, we're, so we're not exporting yet. But what's important to remember is that um, the context of, of the pandemic in, 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 in Ghana and Africa, or definitely in Ghana, is very different to the context of the pandemic. We've been open out and out and out. We've been, since the, the three weeks after it first started back in March, you know, we had a lockdown, lockdown where they closed the borders. But then, um, you know, we reopened the borders last year and, and we've, we've just been out and we've been, okay. we've been, we've been building. Um, so I've been trying to, you know, figure out how to sell these mangoes, and um, and we realized that actually there's no point selling uncut, you know, mangoes. You know, trying to export to London, it's just there's no value in it. Um, and so we started this sort of smoothie business, um, turning the mangoes into smoothies, and we've now, you know, kind of spread into um, creating other flavors that don't use mango. Um, and you know, we're, we're at the proper fledgling startup, you know, figuring everything out from scratch, literally recipes accounting systems how do you do marketing in ghana what language do you speak um and um what's fascinating is that all of you know i remember i used to sit on a trading desk back, back that's in incredible you know what do you do with mangoes that you can't sell create a product I, and sell the product create, create, sell the product so, and, 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 and you know value increase is huge compared to selling the mangoes um and 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 you know and and we've actually created a product that people in Ghana really like and need and, you know, become dependent on because there's just no other source of fresh fruit and fiber and, you know, and, 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 and vegetables in Ghana, right? Um, and no one else has figured out how to do this yet. And like with literally everything else on the ground, no one else, has, no one's figured out how to do it yet. Um, and so there's so many opportunities to come down here and do something real and tangible um, that adds real value. And that's, um, you know, the message I would give, you know, 
take those skills, you know, find yeah. back and look at that stuff, build your network, you know, figure out where all your resources are and where your support will be and who has the money and when you can lean on them. And then get your ass down here um, and, and, and actually do something real. Um, and, it, and, and it's amazing the sense of purpose, the sense of contribution that I get. It, you know, I remember those, those final days, those last months before, before the shit hit the fan. I went to Ronnie Greenwich, you know, one of the only other black traders. And I said to him, you know, Ronnie, what's the purpose of what we do here? And he was like, you know, he gave me that state cliched answer of, you know, we move assets from where they're in excess to where they're in demand to facilitate the wheels of capitalism, et cetera. And I remember I, just, I you know, asked him in twice. Now, second time I sat back down at my desk and I was like, you know, clicking by a cell. And I was like, you know what? That's really not what we do, right? We generate profits for someone and we get a tiny slice of it. Um, and down here for the last three years, um, all the people I've met, all that I've learned, um, you realize that there's a lot of people down here doing some amazing stuff in a really, really tough environment, but the rewards for that are insane. This is the decade and for the entrepreneur, 100%. Literally making smoothies, bro. Brothers Mango Company on, on, on Instagram. Um, when, when does this go out, by the way? Um, I don't know yet. Bro, you see Sorry. me? I'm spontaneous. Bro, we've been on the group chat for nearly two three years bro yeah, yeah but you real. see me bro the, the way i operate yeah is i just get an idea right i've not actually sat down with wait let's let's have a chat bro this isn't going to get edited bro we're just going to put it out there maybe <laughs> like logo bro yeah. you can't fake um being genuine you can't bro we don't script i don't script we have a freestyle conversation. We just put it out there. Whoever cares can listen to it and they, they take. But what I'm going to do, definitely, I need to, con you might already be connected, but I'm going to connect you to a few people within the group because SPA, Stock Pickers, is not just stocks, right? I like people to talk about what they're doing. Um, yeah. I'm seeing a lot of young black people now come through. They want to work, get into banking, but they're already making two, three, four, five K from hair, from nails, from cakes, from, you know, events. And it's like, oh. they're looking at the, the, the entry paycheck and they're, they're like, Deb's actually, I don't know, they're, they're quitting after a year, they're quitting after two years, e-commerce, reselling trainers, you know? So th with the platform, it's networking as well. I want people to put themselves out there because you don't, there's people working at, you know, some of the best hedge funds in the world currently as traders, they're in the, they're in the Telegram group, you know, yeah. um, they're in, you know, the WhatsApp group and they're people doing business in Ghana as well, you know, agriculture and, and different parts of Africa. And definitely you guys should be talking. Um, there's one guy, one of my, one of my guys, I'm going to, you know, connect you with him, um, have conversation. You might not be able to do any business or whatever, but it's it's network right it's it's yeah like, i would never have known that you're doing that now that i know that and i know what also he's doing it's a very simple conversation i get your number uh, get his number say you guys talk right? right i don't even need a paycheck i don't need a cut right and i feel like sometimes too much black people can be a, you know the community can be a bit too transactional sometimes yeah. it's okay for your currency to be favors learn this from that, a lot um, and that, uh, you know, I, I always think about systems and structure when it comes to behavior and culture. Um, and it's it's never a surprise that black culture is that way because we just don't have resources. Um, we've been cash starved, resource deprived for 400 years. And so mm. the behavior, the behavior that comes from that is sometimes, you know, a lack of trust. And a what am I getting back? You know, um, and, it, and, it, and it's hard to build. It, it stops us from building. You know, in Ghana, what we find is that it's really hard to build because nobody trusts each other because of the way we were smooshed together and the way we've been undermined. I mean, we, that's another whole other conversation. But yeah, it's a whole I, other conversation. Defense of black people. <laughs> we're, 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 we're transactional because, Charlie, there's not enough money, man. And it Ghana takes is. more than one person to change it, you know. I try and evangelize this stuff. I tell you how I think and hope some bit goes into you and then you pass it on. And I feel like, we can change I, this generation. We can we can do some yes. some damage, you know, real damage, um, right? Yes, yes. But Excellent anyway, stuff, stuff, good stuff, man. Let's wrap this up. And um, I mean, you're in the group anyway, so like, you know, that that dialogue can always be there. Um, 
it's been a pleasure, bro. Honestly, man, it's it's been good to to sit down and talk. And maybe that's the thing. Maybe we do need to have more conversations. And and you know, you start off talking about finance, you end up talking about mangoes, right? And this is it. Like everyone is doing different things, and everyone is even if you're not doing different things, you have knowledge of people doing. And what the person with the most information wins, right? Yeah. And that's it. Information sharing, knowledge sharing, and you know, as a community, we just we just build. Yeah, and we can build huge things, bro. The potential is the potential of if even the people you know in your network, you all sat down and said what everyone's up to and how you can all help. Bro, the capital is there. The direction isn't there. The strategy isn't there. The network, is, the, 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 the positive, let's do this with the capital or let's put this capital together to support this specific conversations. The difference I see is conversation. And trust. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I know you're trying to wrap it up. No, but, no, um... talk, bro. If you got something to say, <laughs> you look, bro. I'm spontaneous. Yeah, what we, what we, what, 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 what I'm finding, in God, obviously, we're all over the place trying to buy and negotiate for different veg fruits and vegetables. And what we're finding is that the reason that a lot of the reason that people don't trust each other is language and linguistics. Obviously, you put people together. Um, who come from different tribes who speak different languages um, and so because there's no the, the common language is a language that's not common to them which is English um, there's a struggle to deeply understand each other but there's a second and, and much more simple and straightforward problem which is that there are no very there are no good systems for price discovery in Ghana the only way to discover a price is to have a negotiation every single price is negotiation and the problem is that because of the linguistics lack of trust problem the negotiation over a price is always acrimonious. It's never building in trust. All negotiations, a good negotiation, should lead to a growth in trust. Yeah. So both both parties get what you know what they need um, to the fair the, to the fair level that they've that they've, that they've judged. Um, but in Ghana, because no one trusts that they'll get that, the negotiation starts really really wide on both sides. And in getting to the center, they both avoid, both parties avoid talking about the benefits that, they, that will accrue to them as a, perp, as a function of um, executing on this negotiation. And they instead talk about the lack of value that they're getting in order to reduce the price that they have to pay or receive or increase the price that they receive. So what you get is the person who's buying the thing saying that this thing is rubbish because this part of it's bad or that part of it's bad or this is spoiled. And the person who's, I'm trying to sell it is telling you about all their struggles that they faced in trying to deliver this product to you. Um, mm. And so as a result, you never talk about the quality of the product itself. And so when you come away from that negotiation, there's never a sense of, I've purchased something that was worth purchasing. Even if in your deepest mind, you're like, I really wanted this thing. Because of the nature of the conversation, you never feel that what you've actually, the, 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 the agreement that has been made, the execution that's been agreed on, never fulfills you and so all the interactions never lead to a growth in trust and because they never lead to a growth in trust we don't collaborate we don't build equity we don't bring capital to the table and say right this is my contribution let's build this together and it's, it all goes back to the linguistics and the, and the way that we were put together and so we need to make a lot of that we need to put the effort in now to figure out how to in ghana certainly and i think at base level there's some structural stuff that we need to do like figuring out price discovery um, and helping people to be able to work with each other on the positives of their, their contributions rather than to try and undermine each other in order to keep the price low because of the lack of resources. It's like negotiating, it's like negotiating financing. <laughs> it's, like, it's yeah. like negotiating fun. Bro, it's, um, it's so amazing how the skills we learn in finance on a core level, once you stripped out the, 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 the dollar signs and whatever, um, are so transferable into entrepreneurs. Like um, even what I'm doing, building an investing community, teaching people the basics of investing and how to build a, a stocks portfolio. Bro, like people ask me, how do you keep up with Telegram, WhatsApp, Twitter, DMs? And if you look at early experience of banking, bro, you get how many thousand emails a day? One of the first yes. rules you learn 
is how to That's sort, <laughs> how to create rules for your emails, uh, right? Yep. And that's yep, a skill yep, that's yep. transferred into the way I'm able to keep up with chats because it's something that I've been doing for 12 years, just in a different form, right? And it's incredible. My work ethic at the moment, GS levels, I'd say. Mm. Mm. I'm always thinking, I'm always, you know. So, so can I ask you a question? Like, yeah. you know, my past, has affected my drive in, in, in weird ways. And we're not going to go into that right now, but how do you find the drive now? Where does your drive come from? Um, you know, the, the GS environment would have brought the drive out of you for different reasons. Where does it come from now? It comes from seeing a problem with my, I'm a man of my people. I am here for my people, mm. right? And I can see what's missing on certain things that I have got expertise in. So for me, what I do right now is so draining, bro, honestly. The easy thing for me is just to get my capital and just hit my, be doing day trading online, good. Don't need to teach anybody, don't need to have mentees. That's the easy, easy thing to do with my skill set. But for me, when, you, when you've been the fly in the coconut ice cream, I'm gonna say it again for the third time, <laughs> right? Bro. <laughs> <laughs> when you have been the fly in the coconut ice cream you want you don't want someone else to go through that bro yeah. some people there are a few black people who enjoy being the only black person in the room I'm not there I'm not them right so naturally you want to help people with their careers careers was actually the thing I really wanted to do more that was I was like how can I make this my main bag it's difficult. Right. It's difficult. Yeah. For real. The stocks just kind of came miraculously because I had this group where I was just sharing with people everything I was doing, my pension and my sit, my over time. Um, they saw the track record, they saw the winners, the losers, and they saw that raw five years. Devs, you need to put this out there. And then from there it kind of evolved. But even then, it was still not a business, it was still just like just information sharing, and then pandemic happened stock market crash. The Telegram group was created one month before the crash. No way. Wow. The Instagram page, January, Telegram, February, crash, March. Uh, what um, happened on I my remember, birthday? Right, I remember that. I remember that. I remember that. <laughs> I remember that. Yes. <laughs> and then it was, it, it, you know when you just feel the stars are aligning and you're being pushed into something by the forces yeah. of you know, niche God, yep. like just pushing you into something. Okay. That's that's what I just felt. And I just ended up looking at people's portfolios on Zoom like this. And then from there, it was like, I can't just be the portfolio doctor. How about I give them a strategy, a system that I use, right? So you know how to enter positions and, you know, scale in and all this kind of stuff. And then, so I just teach them my system now. So then it was like, some people... I'm doing portfolio doctor. Some people, they're learning my system. And then, you know, now I'm about to launch my e-course, which is on demand. You can learn by yourself. And then, yeah, I just run a mentoring club where I charge people a fee every month. And that just gives them access directly to me. Everyone is using my system. Everyone's done my course in there. And it's, it's just kind of grown from there. But I didn't sit down before the pandemic saying, oh, how can I monetize stock pickers? And how, no, it literally just one thing led to the another in just trying to actually genuinely solve a problem that, bro, I didn't know about what a stocks and shares ISA was until way after I left GS, even though I was a trader. Mm -hmm. Do you know how crazy that is? Well, it is, it seems crazy, but then you realize that it's not crazy because you know what, when you're in finance, the work you're doing isn't really finance in the sense that people think it is. It's not, yeah. it's not that kind of place. Yeah, you're, you're not sitting on IG like, index just trying to... <laughs> no, no, you're sitting on your, you're sitting on a machine, like literally in, you know, either building the machine or tweaking the machine. Yeah. Um, you, you know, and, and it's a very small archipelago in the vast sea of complex finance, you know. So, you know, your tiny bit of Uribor markets, um, you know, is 
it's not going to help you in your pension because you can't invest in your IBOR directly. So you're going to have to learn about stock picking. You're going to have to learn about um, um, other asset classes and commodities, etc., in order to be able to do that. And you can't do that in your That's actually though. phenomenal what you say because some of my clients are ex-traders to director level at banks. Mm -hmm. But you did Forex options. Or you were a trader of um, asset swaps. Yeah. in em right you can't trade that on pa on your personal account mm. yeah. so it's like um even you know there's guys who worked in stocks but in a bank your your market maker and even then you might not be the guy market making you're just working around it or your sales trader but you actually don't know what their funds are doing behind it so I think the biggest edge I got was working in the quantitative hedge fund and seeing how they teach robots. Because then that right. system, right? Risk limits, you know, position limits, how much size goes. You get to see the whole execution framework that you can then say, okay, how can I create a simplified version of this for someone that's just training their pension? No leverage, just cash, um, which is pretty much what I did. Then I combined that with some of the risk management I learned from market making your rival. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, some of the stuff I learned about restricted securities and all this stuff in GS. And, yeah. and before you know it, you realize what I'm actually doing. So I'm taking the, I'm cherry picking the best bits of all the different four ways to make money, putting them together to make a system that works. But yeah. more importantly, proof is in the pudding, right? The thing I wake up every day and I think like, is the system still working or does it need tweaking, right? Mm -hmm. And um, the average investor doesn't know what a stock split is or a rights issue and how to manage a risk around some of this stuff. So you're sitting on Rolls Royce shares and Hargreaves Lanzan has sent you an email, but you don't, you don't know really what you're doing. You might think you do because something says you buy something at a cheaper price, but you may not have really thought through what is fair value. Yep. So these are the kind of things that I'll talk through and help people through. Um, and I enjoy what I do so much, Amazing. but it's so draining. <laughs> it's only in the yeah. past. So, sorry, to, so sorry to pause your flow. Yeah, yeah. Just want to take a step back and say, just highlight the fact that you said that many of your clients are former traders at director level who did these jobs. And I, that message should go out to all the other finance guys and Bro, traders. What you don't know, you don't know. If you didn't work in a quantitative hedge fund, for example, if I didn't work there, I will not, I will not be investing how I invest now. And you can, it's very possible to work in front office, sales trading, think you know what you're doing and not know what you're doing. What you don't know, you don't know. Right, not many people, even in our industry, very few people have strong proprietary trading experience. Right, they don't teach yeah. you this stuff. They just you get to VP and they say, "We want you to start making money now, not just market making." <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then your career goes like this. <laughs> <laughs> your expenses just magically know how to do it. Yeah, <laughs> so it's like it takes humility. It takes humility because I think two, three of the guys were actually my mentors. People who taught me some of the things that almost everything I know. No. And they're the guys sit down, Zoom, do my course. Right? And they're blown away. Brilliant. Brilliant. So important. And I'm a student. I'm a stu that. Yeah, bro, so, bro. One of the hardest things is, and you know what we're like as traders anyway. So you work in a bank, you think you know it. You work in equity mm -hmm. research. You've done a CFA. You've written publications. It's not enough to manage money. There's a reason you work in research and not in trading. The skill set is slightly different because when you are putting your own capital and you see the price drop, what do you do next? You know, like in boxing, they say, Everyone thinks they're it until they get hit in the face. There is a trade, there's, there's a similar thing for investing. 
right? Until you get faced with a scenario, a real life scenario of you actually having capital invested in the stock and it's dropped 60%, what do you do? What, just start taking losses on your, on your little, if you, I said to someone, if you take a 50 pound loss 20 times, that's a grand, gone. You add executions in, execution costs, that's a one grand five. You started with 5K, you're now on three and a half K. You now need a 60%, 40, 50% return to just get break even. Your strategy cannot be taking stop losses. It's better you scale in. So it's like on common wow. sense for the common investor, right? Because YouTube videos say, oh, take stop loss there. There's no leverage. The main risk is bankruptcy. If you've eliminated that risk, just getting the right prices that can, and having a plan in place, if, if, plan, if, if your original plan doesn't go to plan and price drops, right? Every, the, the, the way an everyday investor invests cannot be the same way an asset manager in a bank with bottomless. It's different. With, even, with, yeah. even the access is different. In a bank, you won't be able to trade some of those penny stocks because you've got your entry criteria of what's acceptable. And where does it all come down to? Funding. Can Treasury fund that asset, that stock? That's a penny stock. Can it raise financing against it? You don't have those restrictions as an individual investor. So you have a little bit of an edge. But you can say, listen, I've made 50% profit this year. I can take a portion of that and go and dance with the pennies, knowing that if they go bankrupt, but if I get two, one or two winners, and then you go again, making profit the right way, and then taking a bit of that profit mm -hmm. and going into really mm -hmm. high, high risk stuff. Again, still with the right system and stuff, but you, you, you can afford the risk. Yes. It's a it's a it's a, it's a it's a lower risk way of of, 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 of exercising leverage because you're only using your profits to, to leverage and the into leverage the higher exactly. And then you know what I really have is I've got a real time watch list, got a thousand stocks on it. I look at every day. Wow. And that is data. Every day I know what jumped thirty percent, what dropped fifty percent, what dropped ten percent. And you're looking at this every day. You're going to see patterns that the charts yeah. can't show you. And you're going to sense and see opportunity. So I've got, you know, the alerts is basically, I like, um, I like this stock right now. I've done my analysis, financials, tick, tick, everything, tick, tick, tick about this stock. Um, but price, very few people not know price. Price is irrational, right? The everyday investor likes a stock, does his, all these YouTube checks that they read in the book and go, just goes to buy and says, I'm a long-term. And then it, that thing that looks so perfect drops 50% because price is irrational. And then what do you do? You spent your budget for that stock in one go. Whereas if you just spent a bit and respected the fact that markets can be irrational, you're in a position where you can add to it, get more shares for your money and so on and so forth. You know, so these are like some of the concepts and they all sound simple. When you put the simple things together, you get an absolute machine of consistency, right? Some things can go wrong, but not enough to take you out. And you realize investing is a game of surviving more than it is a game of how much money can I make? So it's a risk management thing. You know, they say in football, attack wins you games, defend, defense wins you titles. Defense in investing is your risk management. That's what gives you that consistency in, long, in the long term. And attack really is, okay, that trade that makes you money. A good trade can make you money. Risk management will give you a consistent, protect your downside in the long term, which allows your winners will take care of themselves. Absolutely right. So this is, this is, this is, this is a reflection of the adage of, of, of hard work makes people lucky, right? Like, the point is that you need to have created the platform and to have been tweaking the platform such that when the opportunity comes, you can execute. Exactly. People don't, 
people often, you know, I mean, uh, just to take a, a slight segue, in Ghana, um, everyone says to me, can you teach me to trade? Can you, like, do a trading school? Can you, like, and I'm like, you know, I would love to, but... Um, I need to open a know. middle office for you. I need to... <laughs> <laughs> With my knowledge is... We need, let's create an investment you know, bank. I, I, can, I can do just an ETF book <laughs> with some index on so that, you know, I can teach you how to do that. No, um, but no, seriously, it's, it's, you, you kind of realize that people need to learn. People need to understand and know, and there is no opportunity for them to learn. Um, the things that you're talking about right now, um, you will only learn through experience, like, because nobody teaches you, even as a trader on a trading floor at a bank, no one's teaching you this stuff. You literally have to go in and make that loss. You have to experience holding that, being the bag holder down 50% and go, uh, okay, next time, what will I do? Um, and, and, and you have that experience and it's really, really valuable. Um, and um, what I see in Ghana is that um, everybody wants to learn, but in terms of systems, where they are is just gaining access to um, a trading platform, even literally just getting access to a trading platform. And what I'm realizing is that um, no, very few of us actually um, do the, the proper due diligence to go through the entire process and understand what do I need to do at each step before you start executing, make your plan. Before, and, and, and obviously that's, that's how you have to operate in trading. Otherwise, um, what you don't realize is it's just the system. It's having access to the system, protecting your capital, and being able to exercise when the opportunity arises. Mm. People think that you just need to be in the market. And it's like, no, you don't. You, you spend most of our time just watching the market. Yeah. And it's when you're always trading and in the market all the time, that's when you've actually got an issue because it means that you can't really see and you're executing everything or reacting all the time to the market. Um, and you know, it sounds like a lot having a, a, a watch list of a thousand stocks, but I bet you don't have a trade in a thousand stocks at the same time. You'll have a, a trade in a small subsection of those um, at a given time. Still what number, what number comes to your head? I'm thinking like eight, 10, maybe 15. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I stretch it to 20, 25, but I wanted people to hear your answer, right? Because there's people who probably heard my system and I say to them, listen, you should only have 15 stocks, you know, and, and, and it's good for me to put you on the spot like that and for you to just also come because it's confirmation you know yeah and then the individual investor likes to see different people say the same thing because then they go look at their portfolio they've got 30 stocks on the 2k portfolio and then they're like whoa okay doing the wrong thing. <laughs> and also the newbie the newbie who there's never, maybe never done my course and maybe never interacted who thought they were doing the right thing because they started small. They started small, divided 2,000 by <laughs> 30 <laughs> stocks. But when they heard this conversation, it's a reality check. There's so many people who did my course because they heard me say one thing and they looked at what they were doing. Like, nah. What I said made sense. What they were doing was like, they realized that it was a eureka moment. These interviews are good because it also, someone else who's got, you know, 10 plus years experience doing it. Leads me to my next question. Are you, are you in market still in any way, shape or form? And how's that been? Do you, I, don't, I, don't, I guess it must be difficult in systems wise, tech wise, platform wise over yeah. there. So, so there, there are ways to trade. Um, you know, there are brokers that you know someone in the Ghana jurisdiction can apply to. People like Alpari, um, yeah. who just won you know FX Broker of the Year at FX Expo in Dubai, um, for example. Um, you can get access to platforms like that. Um, but I'll be honest with you, no time. I don't really want. I just don't. I, you know, to trade, you have to trade. You have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a full. Listen, I keep telling yeah. people. You want to, because people still ask me, devs, teach me how to trade. Because I, I day trade, but I don't yeah. teach people day trade. I teach people investing. Yeah, yeah. And, it's, and I, I always tell people, when you invest properly, it's boring. Yeah. So people want the adrenaline, they want the devs teach me. Are you ready to quit your job? No. 
to be a good trader, you need to be doing it full time. Every time. You need to be full news, just data, skills, tech, yeah. looking at everything. And if you're not in a position to do that, it Correct. can be the catastrophic. Correct. And catastrophic is the word. And you are guaranteed to fail. The only way to succeed as a trader is to put in the work so that you get that level where you can make intuitive decisions because you understand the system. Your Even sometimes system. without actually doing analysis. Yes. But because, it's because you built a system and you understand it. And you, you know, you time. understand the world, the macro, you just see gold there, boom, you know, probability wise. And, correct. And it's about probabilities. I've seen this many times before, or I've modeled this many times before. Most, most, you know, six out of 10 times, this is what happens. Okay, we can do this trade with this much risk, right? You know, um, you know markets, markets gap down 30% over the last week. You know what? In the last 10 years, that's a good opportunity to buy the dip. Let me buy the dip based on experience. But if you just come into the market, it's down 30%. You're like, whoa, let me chop my position because damn, down 30%. Um, and, 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 or if you wanted to hold the position, you wouldn't be able to justify why you were holding the position down. percent. But if you could say, you know what, this you know, 30% drawdown has happened four times in the last 10 years and each time it's ripped around, ripped back. Um, and so I'm buying the dip because the Fed Reserve is doing X, Y, Z, right? So there's a combination of probability, you know, past observations and experience and also an understanding of fundamentals. So there's three different contributors to that decision. But if you're not sat there watching the markets, understanding in the first place what the Fed is doing, which takes a lot of effort to understand in the first place, um, then you will not be able to make the right decisions. Um, and that's why not everyone can be a trader. It's just, um, it takes so much to be able to concentrate yeah. and focus on one thing like that. Um, um, and, and it requires you to be able to make difficult decisions that emotionally, you know, when, when you're down 50% on your own money, your, 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 your body starts to act differently. Your, your rationality goes out the window, which is why prices are not rational in the first place. Uh, because human beings, when under extreme duress, you know, down 50% is extreme duress, um, your judgment is really impaired. If you think about Lewis Hamilton trying to, you know, um, eke out a win in a race, you know, you're, you're in the 52nd lap um, and your wheels are, you know, like fraying to bits and you're under pressure and you're concentrating, trying to keep on the line. Um, but everything is working against you. And the only thing that gets you through is the tiny bit of knowledge from the experience you've had. Yeah. Um, and the only way to, you know, you have to sit and dedicate yourself um, to procedure and process and learning. Um, and so being, it's not, it's not for everyone. It really it's is not people for thinking everyone. about money, but it's not for everyone. It's not for everyone. And we, we're going to close it there. I feel like, bro, like we can, we can easily bang out another hour, two <laughs> hours. Um, and we'll have another chat, you know. Um, maybe it might be some of this stuff in a bit more detail. You know, some people might want to know in a bit more detail, how do you run an index arbitrage book, you know, yeah. um, with the inventory. You know, I mean? some people might want to know a bit more about, you know, that journey with the mangoes and what you're doing, and, you know. So, yeah, I mean, we can easily do a part two, part three, part four, and just drill into, like, you know, some of this stuff a bit more. Um, but, yeah, Bo, it was good sitting down and yeah. just having some conversation, some dialogue on you know your journey a bit of my journey um and and the lessons that the most important thing here is 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 what we all learn from it what 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 can we draw what can we learn from different people's experiences and put that back into the community so you know everyone else can 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 benefit you know at the end of the day bro you were a lot of people's guinea pigs i am a lot of people's guinea pigs because i've I've done some, <laughs> when I went from GS to the, the Jewish family office doing prop people for us, I was crazy. But I wanted to just go, I've always been an entrepreneur, so I wanted to try and see, okay, maybe they work out how, how, how they weren't increasing my limits, decided to take a year out and then went to Barclays to work in treasury finance and then eventually ended up in the quant hedge fund, you know, like, I can't recommend that path for someone else, you know, you don't take that path. But that path was there for a reason. And I've, you take the lessons and the knowledge from and the experience and you're never, ever, ever starting. I'm, I'm going to leave it on this, you know. You're never, ever, ever starting from zero. 
even when your chips are down, you're starting from experience. Not they can take away your money, you can lose what you can't lose your experience. That's always your starting point when things drop, and that's what enables people like yourself, like myself, to be able to bounce back from setbacks. You're starting from experience always, you know, experience and network. Two of the most yeah. powerful things ever. Yeah. And let me tell you this. So, I mean, you know, you, you might imagine that my network has been decimated because, you know, I'm a global pariah of some kind. But um, even me, um, what I found is that um, network is so valuable that infamy or famous it doesn't matter. Uh, everybody needs me to be in their network as much as I need them to be in my network. Um, and your network never goes, no matter what happens. Yeah. People, human beings, human relationships are so resilient. And my biggest lesson has been that, like, like people stay, people hold on, people, 100%. people are good. Your network will stay. Protect and, and I found this because, um, I mean, like, some of the people that I'm still in touch with were people that I just genuinely, honestly just felt were like, <laughs> you know, you, you work somewhere and you leave and then that distance mm. goes and you just kind of knew that, okay, it was just a work thing. But there have been some people, very instrumental people that even, because I've always been myself, this is one thing I never compromised on. I've always tried to be myself and I'm a blunt person. Um, mm. If I think someone, one of my good friends is very senior, right? He said to me, Deb, one thing I like about you is with other people, you're a black guy. Other people make me feel my position. Mm -hmm. You know, like you're in a group of friends, you're watching football, nothing to do with your careers, but because you're this guy, people are afraid to disagree with you or to have a go at you or you're playing football and no one wants to break your legs. <laughs> and he's like, <laughs> he's like, Debs, you actually make me just feel human. Like, because even though the gap is nine years, whatever, we're playing football, we're going to play as though mm -hmm. we're the same level. Yeah. You know, I'm going to kick his legs yeah. off or, <laughs> or do whatever. And if, and if we square up and we're fighting, I'm going to go at it like, you know, and, 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 I, and I always tell people, just be yourself around people. The people who, people, you can, you can walk eggshells and then those people don't even care about you anyway. Or you can be yourself and the people who will be drawn to you through life will be drawn to you for genuine reasons and they will stay through thick and thin. And the people who don't, naturally, they were, they were never going to be that important to your life anyway. And I live by that. Um, so, um, uh, one last thing for me, um, which is that a lot of people use me as their guinea pig. Um, what I've learned since the last, actually in the last few months, is that a lot of very senior people use me as their guinea pig. So, um, at the very most upper echelons of leadership in finance and other industries, when the thing happened to me, a lot of people realized that. So, what the British tried to do is to say, no matter what you contribute, you are, your value has been um, eroded away by what you've done. Um, and what a lot of Black people realized was that their position in wherever they were was conditional. As a, result, as a result of what happened to me, they realized that it's always conditional. No matter how good, no matter how much you contribute, no matter how much you work, no matter how much you reflect the values of the organization you're coming from. Um, and what a lot of these senior guys did was then force their institutions to put in clauses or design ways in which they could operate so that they would not be vulnerable to be abused by their institutions in the way that they did. Um, and the difference is that they realized because the conversation was one about value, they realized that they needed to value themselves first mm -hmm. and then express that understanding of their own value in order to protect themselves should they end up in a situation like I did. And I think that's, you know, for me, one of the biggest lessons is know your own value because I didn't really realize what my value was at UBS. And 
Um, and even though I was giving everything I had um, and pushing the organization forward, I still didn't understand what my value was. Um, and if I had done, I don't think I would have ended up in the situation I did because yeah. I would have advocated for myself more and fought for myself more instead of sacrificing myself as we are taught to do um, as, as black kids, or as certainly as I was taught to do. But um, the point is you need to value yourself. Um, and if, if, if that, you know, and I'm telling you right straight, whoever's watching this video, you are pretty awesome and you need to recognize what your value is so that, you know, the people around you recognize what that value is and that you get rewarded for it and you're protected. Okay. And there you have it. Um, don't waste anything you hear from this video if you're listening. Um, there's been a lot of gems on a lot of different topics, whether it's careers, whether it's investing whether it's, you know, you know, contribution back home in Africa. Um, and it's very, you know, if, if you have questions, you know, reach out to me, you know, if, if there are a lot of people who just want a specific, you know, career session, want to hear a bit more, just, just reach out to me. Maybe I'll put something on and invite a panel of, 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 of people in my network through. Um, but yeah, it's been an absolute honor, um, pleasure having this conversation um and yeah i'm going to, going to get out to the network hopefully some people they 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 they, they listen to it. it is a long time about two hours um maybe people might have to come back you know but yeah mm -hmm. i feel i feel like people just press play and just listen because yeah i feel like these conversations haven't been had you know and that's what i'm here for because i'm not in banking anymore the shackles are off yeah. the shackles are off in Ghana you you know I feel like maybe when you're in London still like you're thinking um I can't say certain things I can't say how it was I can't discuss this person's salary I can't when the shackles are off and you you it's one of the most liberating things ever because you can literally just speak and nobody can say anything you know and these are the kind of conversations that you know quite rare to have because usually I'll be in a bank or used to be trying to get another leg up in your career within that space so you say bits and pieces and you say it behind closed doors you don't get to say it on YouTube where people actually get to uh, to hear an insight of what life is really like on the inside and you know some of the nuances the stuff that never gets said you know salaries what you could have been earning like what you got paid and I mean it's absolutely tragic any trader is getting 1K, 2K, 3K bonuses when you are doing a job where someone else in your seat, regardless of their journey, is getting 30K, 40K, 50K. Do you know what I mean? Like, and, and, and these things need to be exposed um, because they're happening everywhere. Yeah. And now people know their worth a bit more. Look, we know, we know how the industry is. You can get a zero. We know that. Um, but it breaks a stigma as well because there are a lot of people who may be going into trading for the wrong reasons. They absolutely hate it and don't think they've got their skills, but they're going in for their money. They get to realize actually a bit of a reality check that like, it's not guaranteed. You're not no, guaranteed not. to walk into a role, get a high base, and to get a high bonus is business dependent. You know, um, I've had experiences where started off with a big bonus, you know, your 40 grand or whatever. And, yeah, three, you're getting less. Or <laughs> you've moved job to another bank and you're getting a number that makes you really question if you like trading anymore, you know? And then, <laughs> you know, you go to another place and you're like, oh, you're back again. And it's like, it messes with your head a little yes, bit. Yes, it does. It really it's can so mess with your head. Because you're, awesome. you're comparing, you're like, why is it here yeah, you got this? And the second year where you actually performed and made... You got this, and then you move to this bank. You got that, and then move to a fire. And then you, but it's a, it's all a learning curve, and we're always going to be each other's guinea pig. But it's wasted if that information doesn't actually get passed down. And that's one of the most important things that I've, I've, I've figured is people need to tell their stories. Do you know how many black people got frustrated out of banking? Yeah, and went to consulting, yeah. or you know. They were tri just got frustrated, weren't getting promoted, were getting underpaid. You know, you've had a fantastic year. Someone tells you 
You're not your your bonus is zero. 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 Oh, hey. I know I, I know I promised I said I'd already said my last thing, but this reminds me that bonus is not about contribution, right? Bonus mm. is about retention and it's about making sure that we get to keep and motivate the people that we want to keep and motivate. Right? It yeah. really, really, really is not about contribution. But that's the first mistake everybody makes, and I made it too. You know, got there and you're like, but I did all this this year. Why have you only paid me a thousand pounds? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not about Especially that. Especially when you work right. in a revenue generating business and you know yeah. what the business was doing before and you can Correct. see your monetary value yes. in the seat that you're in. I mean, to keep a trader in the seat, that it costs a firm like, what, half a mil, 250K? Yeah. By the time, yes. yeah, that, that's that's the cost, you know? And they're like, are you making that back through the value that you're you're generating? Um, but yeah, someone up there is eating. And yeah, I feel like in time, it will correct itself. Likely what happens is base salaries go up and bonuses get cut and that becomes a new economy, especially as, you know, Volcker rules come in and prop trading is really being taken out of the system and banks are literally just turning into William Hill or Ladbrokes, so, you know, like market making engines and that only and the robots have arrived, automation, machine learning, AI, you know, to do quite a lot of this kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, bro. Well, Happy Sunday. That's all there is to say. Happy Sunday and enjoy <laughs> enjoy the rest of your weekend. Um, but yeah, we we'll chat again, bro. We we're on the chat with you know, um, like I said, I'll try and connect you with one of my boys who's you know does a lot of this agri agricultural stuff. Um maybe you could you two can you know chat and you know share share info synergies and so on and so forth. That'd be amazing. It's been a real pleasure to be on here. Thanks for thanks for having me on and um Thanks for letting us talk about kind of anything. Not <laughs> yeah. Really nice real conversations about stuff that might actually value people um, that people can benefit from. So um, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. No worries, bro. Take care. Bye. Right, bye. Thank you.